ahora sí podemos comenzar la transmisión. Perfecto. Eh, bueno, voy a cambiar a inglés. Eh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today in this, um, for this seminar. Um, I'm going to present our speaker. Uh, Dr. Oder Recavi is a full professor in the Life Sciences faculty, faculty at Tel Aviv University. His mission is to challenge fundamental long-held scientific dogmas. Uh, and using C. elegans nematodes, he provided direct evidence that an acquired trait can be inherited, worked to elucidate the mechanisms and rule of a small RNAs uh, mediated transgenerational inheritance, which is part of what he's gonna talk about today. Um, discovered that nematodes uh, brains can control the behavior of their progeny and identified a simple neuronal circuit level mechanism that explains uh, economic irrationality. Uh, aside from his work on nematodes, Odette utilized genome sequencing of ancient DNA to piece together fragments of the Dead Seal Scrolls as demonstrated um, and demonstrated that toxoplasma parasites can be genetically engineered to deliver drugs to the nervous system. Uh, he is an ERC fellow and was awarded many prestigious prizes, including the Polymath Prize, uh, the Kadar Award, the Blayatnik Award, the Krill Wolf Award, uh, the Alon and First Bikura Prizes and the Gross uh, Leaper Fellowship. Uh, and uh, he was elected as one of the 10 most creative people in Israel under 40 and one of the 40 most promising people in Israel under 40, which is uh, fantastic. I have to add also that uh, Professor Oder Rehabi is a fantastic speaker and science communicator uh, overall. He has really excellent uh, talks available on, on, on Twitter. He organized the Woodstock of Science conference in February 2020, which uh, has a very uh, novel format and very exciting uh, proposition to share science in a more uh, kind of relaxed environment, I would say, and uh, sharing data, which is unpublished, that I think it's very cool as well. And uh, probably you all know, but he's also uh, very big on Twitter and his account is, is fantastic to follow um, both uh, in a scientific and non-scientific way uh, as well. So it's really a huge pleasure for me that you uh, accepted our invitation, and with that, I give you the mic. Thanks a lot. It's a real pleasure to be here. I wish I could be in uh, Mexico. I've never been, but I will someday. But, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, and today, uh, and as you mentioned in your very kind uh, introduction, we, we do many different things in the lab, but the main focus of our study so far has been uh, epigenetic inheritance and the inheritance of memory. And I intentionally gave this seminar this, uh, this uh, title, Heritable Memories, which is a little controversial because we know intuitively that we shouldn't transmit, we, we shouldn't be able to transmit memories across generations. But still, uh, we know from um, anecdotal and also unanecdotal evidence that we are not born a blank slate, that some knowledge is innate, we are born with it. And this is a question that I mean, in the, even the Greeks dealt with. And we, we see it in everyday life. We have many examples for this. For example, when I was uh, doing my postdoc in, in New York, um, I, I discovered that what New York, New York uh, people do, New Yorkers, to, to scare away pigeons, they really hate pigeons. What they do is they put a, a, a sculpture of an owl on the window. And then the, the pigeon sees the owl and runs away. And this is interesting because um, I imagine, although I'm not a zoologist or a bird expert, that there are not too many owls in, in New York City and that these urban, urban pigeons never really met a, a, an owl. So they're probably born with some conception that an owl is something scary, but another animal is not. But this is of course purely anecdotal, it's not real uh, science. But this question has, the, or the question of the blank slate 
uh, has been studied also uh, scientifically. Uh, so here, still in the in the realm of psychology, experiments that were done in the United States uh, in the 80s have shown that monkeys, which are born in captivity, so they are born in the lab, they don't know anything aside from what the researcher uh, told them, they they find it very hard to learn that uh, toy flowers are scary. So they don't know anything about the world. And if you pair a toy flower with something scary like an electric shock or a, a loud noise or something like this, the monkey is not afraid of it. It takes a while for the monkey to create this association that flowers are scary because of this pairing. Eventually they learn, but it takes a while, many pairings. In contrast, the, the monkeys immediately learn the toy snakes are scary if you pair the toy snake to, to a large, a loud sound or an electric shock. So they are not born with the fear of snakes, but you need just one pairing for them to never forget the toy snakes are, are scary. And this shows us that they are born with the tendency to learn to be afraid of snakes and not flowers. So this is somehow encoded in the heritable material. And the question is how? And it's a, we don't know, too, we don't know enough about, uh, about, uh, about memory, but it's clear that this type of memory is not encoded in synapses. Normally when we think about uh, memories, we think about memories as uh, present in the synaptic connections that connect different neurons in the brain. And if you learn something, you make certain synapses stronger and, so, and other synapses weaker. Here it can't be synapses because we all start our lives from a single cell, a fertilized egg. So at that point, this single cell doesn't have any synapse with other cells because there aren't any other cells. So it has to be somehow, the, the, the memory has to be molecular. It is perhaps encoded in the DNA sequence or in other molecules that are inher inherited. And I think this is a very nice angle for standing memory because it's much simpler than trying to look at the complicated brains that we have with billions of neurons and so on and trying to understand how the memories are encoded there. That's my, my angle to, to memory studies. Still, I think that if we want to make our life easier, then it's better to perhaps, at least for me, everyone can do what they want, of course, to, to focus on, on simple brains. Our brain is immensely complex, has billions, many billions of neurons, and each neuron is connected by thousands of synapses. And that's also the, the case in, in, in simpler organisms like mice. In contrast, C. elegans, nematodes, these simple worms, round worms, they have just 302 neurons, that's it. And it's always 302. And only altogether less than 7,000 synapses. So it's, these are manageable numbers. It's as simple as it gets, and it's much, much simpler than, than the brains of uh, other more complicated organisms. If you go to, even if you go to Drosophila, it's much more complex. And of course, the, 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 the worm can't do what uh, mammals do using its brain. It doesn't have uh, emotions as we normally use to think about emotions, or it can not write uh, poetry or calculate mathematic uh, equations, uh, solve mathematic uh, uh, riddles, but it can nevertheless perform many complex behaviors. So it can sense thousands of odors. It dedicates a large percentage of its genome to odor receptors and it can uh, mate, it can sense the uh, touch, uh, and it can even learn simple things like an association between an odor and food. Um, and not only that, we have a, a, a full connectome of the brain of the worm, of the nervous system of the worm. We know, we know each of these 302 neurons by name, and we know with which neuron each neuron is connected. Um, and, and the worm is transparent, so you can actually see the neurons fire using calcium imaging and this type of techniques and really have a, a, an, an unparalleled level a, a, a capacity or, or a resolution of understanding. And so I think it's a, very, it's a great model system for neuroscience. And of course, this is not only myth thinking, this is the, the reason that Sidney Brenner established C. elegans as a model system for biology to study how the nervous system works. Uh, okay. When I started working with C. elegans, I want, I, uh, because of these advantages, I wanted to study memory in C. elegans. And uh, when I went to do my postdoc, that was in 2010, um, at the lab of Oliver Robert in Colombia, 
I wanted to focus on a, on a simple memory, not on any type of memory, but on a very, very well-defined memory that's also restricted in time. And this memory is called imprinting. And imprinting is a, is a long-term memory that you can only acquire uh, at a particular uh, time. Normally, it's, uh, in most cases, it's early during development. So for example, you probably heard that salmon swim back against the current to the place where they were hatched. They, they use the, the order to, to, to locate it. And babies are attached uh, to their mothers. This is neonatal attachment, which is a very strong, and these type of memories are very strong and they last for a long time, and they can only be acquired during a particular time. Imprinting was, um, imprinting was discovered by uh, Conrad Lawrence, who got the Nobel Prize for it. He characterized it in birds. And he showed that birds, when they hatch, uh, um, they follow the first moving stimuli that they see. And this is a very strong attachment, as you can see. It's normally their mother, but here they're following a, a dog or, or a kid because they think that it's their mother. Also in C. elegans, there is imprinting. And, and the lab of Oliver Hoppert, where I went to do my postdoc between 2010 and 2012, showed a few years uh, before, in 2005, together with Jean-Jacques Remy from uh, Marseille, that worms can be imprinted. So normally, when you teach a worm an association, for example, between a neutral odor and food, you, you, you teach them that this neutral odor is attractive, should be attractive because it signals that there's food around. Uh, this association uh, lasts for only, the, the memory lasts for only two hours approximately. That's a shame because it would be nicer if it was a longer memory for us uh, neuroscientists. But, what uh, Remy and Hobart showed in this uh, science paper was that if you form the association, if you do the pairing of the neutral odor to food at the L1 stage, so the worm uh, transitions between four larval stages because, before it becomes an adult, then the memory lasts for weeks, for multiple weeks. It becomes almost permanent during the lifetime of the worm. And, uh, and it happens only if you do it at this L1 stage. So, so this is what I wanted to study. In their paper, in the science paper, they showed that the memory depends on a particular interneuron and a receptor that is expressed just in one neuron. So it, it really it sounds like an amazing way to study memory. And that was my plan. So in 2010, I traveled to, to New York to do the, my postdoc on this question of, on how this works. But then my, my plans changed completely because as soon as I got there, uh, I got there in, in April, I think it was, really in parallel, there was a, pa a paper published in, um, in current biology by Jean-Jacques Remy, which, who is the first author on this science paper that I just showed you, that showed that not only can worms be imprinted, but also the imprint transmissions to the next generation. And this is, was a, a really shocking thing. This is just a signal of a shock because, uh, because we know intuitively that this shouldn't happen. Obviously, your kids won't remember anything that I'm telling you today. This is obvious, okay? And, uh, and the paper it was, it was very controversial. It's still controversial till this day. And, and there was only one figure. So you see just this schematic figure that I'm showing you here. So no data, just this figure and no mechanism. But it was still very intriguing. So I said, you know, my plans change. This is what I want to study because it's so much more interesting. Not only does it violate our intuition, it also goes against one of the, the most basic rules or laws of biology. It's even called the second law of biology, also known as the Wiseman barrier. First law of biology is natural selection. The second one is this law that, that uh, August Wiseman formulated in the 19th century. And Wiseman was one of Darwin's most prominent followers. And what he said, he didn't use the words that I'm writing here on the, on the slide because these words didn't exist like genetics. Uh, but, but in principle, what he said was that the, the only tissue that can transmit information to the next generation is the germline, the sperm or the egg. Because, and, and the soma is segregated, the germline is segregated from the soma. What happens in the soma stays in the soma. It can't be inherited. And this is a fundamental dogma of biology. And uh, uh, Wiseman formulated this uh, uh, rule of his, 
now known as the Wiseman barrier, to show that Lamarckian inheritance cannot happen. Okay, to show that this is impossible. And since the 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 so, because if the soma the, the tissues that interact with the the environment cannot transmit responses to the next generation, then inheritance of acquired traits or Lamarckian inheritance is impossible. And indeed, if we go to the gym and we build a big muscle, so we change the somatic cells, the muscle, it, it, our kids won't be stronger as a result because what happens in the soma stays in the soma, okay? And it's also compatible with what we know about genetic inheritance, about DNA-based inheritance. If we get a mutation in the, in the muscles, in the DNA of the muscles, then there's no way to com communicate this genetic change to transform it to a mutation in the germline. And since the next generation will be formed from the combination of a sperm and the egg, it doesn't happen what happened to the genome in the somatic cells. Only changes, only mutation in the germ cells affects the next generation. So the Wiseman barrier is compatible with genetics as we know it. Not only that, it is also compatible with some discoveries, ma major discoveries made in epigenetics. And we, so, um, we, we, we now know, and this is mostly from uh, studies in, in, uh, in mammals, that uh, changes to the chromatin, so um, DNA methylation or histone modification in the germline are largely erased in two waves of reprogramming, epigenetic reprogramming. So in the, in the germline and early embryo, they are being replaced so that the next generation can start as a blank slate without these epigenetic changes or these chromatin changes more accurately actually uh, that occur in the germline. And this is true. Uh, it was shown also in humans, but we know that it's not entirely true because approximately 10% and of course the numbers can change of the chromatin modifications do last. But by and large there's resetting and most of the changes or most of the modifications are removed and then being redeposited according to the, to the, to, uh, the typical uh, program. So it seems like all of these, the, like the Wasman barrier is a real barrier, a real obstacle that, that should prevent inheritance of acquired traits or transmission of memory between generations. Um, and this is of course uh, true. However, it seems, but, but we don't know what's going on with RNA. And specifically, it seems that worms don't care much about the Wasman barrier. And we know this for quite a while now. So Fire and Mello in the nature paper shown here on the left have shown, have discovered the, the mechanism of RNAi. The double strand RNA is the subset for RNAi. It's being chopped up uh, uh, to small RNA that lead to gene silence to RNA interference. And in this paper that awarded them with the Nobel prize, they also found another something that many people uh, missed, which is that if you inject somatic tissues of C. elegans with double strand RNA, you get silencing of RNAi in other tissues all over the body, including in the germ cell. And later they've also shown that it's enough to just feed worms with bacteria that produce double strand RNA for the worms to get the silencing, not only in the site of ingestion where the bacteria are being uh, destroyed and the RNA is taken up, but also in other tissues. It spreads throughout the body leading to silencing also in the next generation. And this is an essay that every C. elegans uses, every C. elegans lab uses daily. Whenever we want to silence a gene, we don't just look at the worms that actually were fed with that bacteria, but we look at the next generation because we want to, to have a large N to, to, to score the phenotype in many worms. So this is extremely robust. Fire and Mello in this paper didn't know, didn't show in, in these early papers what's actually being transferred between cells and reaches the germline. Is it the RNA itself, the double strand RNA, or maybe it's the small RNAs, or maybe it's a downstream silencing that occurs because small RNAs in C. elegans go into the nucleus and guide chromatin modifiers to the DNA, changing the chromatin structure, condensing DNA, condensing the, 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 the DNA around the target. Although this wasn't really shown, but there are many evidence is probably happening. So it wasn't clear what's being inherited. Is it the, the, the RNA and which RNAs? And, uh, or is it a chromatin? That wasn't clear. Over the years, many people studied the mechanism by which RNA spreads between cells. And the, the main figure here is Craig Hunter from Harvard. 
and many genes were found to be nece necessary specifically for systemic RNA, for non-cell autonomous silencing, and not for silencing with, within the same uh, uh, cell. And the most famous of these genes encode for the protein CID1, which is a transmembrane uh, transporter that actually allows double strand RNA to move between cells. But all of this is known with regard to artificial double strand RNA induced silencing. RNA that we bring from the outside, synthetic or artificial RNA. It's not clear which endogenous small RNAs or double strand RNA move between C. elegans cells and reaches the germline. This is unknown. We don't know even that it happens, although there are supporting evidence that suggests that this is the, uh, the case, including our work that I will discuss soon. Okay. When I started working on this um, at, um, in my postdoc, I, I wanted to know whether there's any physiological relevance to this. Or alternatively, if it's just some artifact of, of double strand RNA induction from the outside. I mean, we, and, and so I looked for a memory that could be perhaps transmitted between generation that will be related to RNAi and silencing. And at the moment, and at the time, there wasn't anything published, no paper whatsoever. So I did what I think most of you do also, which is I just, um, um, I looked at Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, the part about the, the ecology of the worm, I had a part that was since then removed because the Wikipedia people are really good. That says in the part about the ecology, it says that C. elegans is one of the few forms of life that's not, that doesn't have any natural virus that infects it. And this is of course amazing, especially in, in Corona times. Uh, and because we know that viruses are so good at infecting. And how does the worm resist viruses if it doesn't even have um, dedicated immune cells, doesn't have T cells and B cells and antibodies and NK cells and so on. The, the silicons resist viruses so efficiently because uh, it uses RNAi very efficiently. The RNA uh, is very uh, um, um, strong in, our, in C. elegans and when the virus replicates, if it's an RNA virus, it has to form a double strand RNA at some point, at which point it is recognized by the RNAi system and led to destruction Small RNAs are made from the double strand RNA of the virus and then attack the viral genome again, leading to silencing. And the hypothesis that I had was that perhaps, like artificial small RNAs, um, like artificial double strand RNA, these small RNAs that are made against viruses are transmitted between generations or memorized, if you wish, across generations to transmit immunity across generations. So a sort of a heritable vaccine type of theory. That was my hypothesis. And to study this, I used an artificial virus that was shown by others to replicate in C. elegans. And this is a very simple Flockhouse virus, an RNA virus, that has one of these proteins removed and replaced with GFP. So when uh, the virus replicates um, of a transgene, you know that, that the worm is infected because you see that it shines in green. And what people before me and also I uh, found was that wild type worms are completely resistant to the virus. The worms that have functional RNA, they make small RNAs against the virus, they are called virNAs, and lead, these lead to the destruction of the virus. However, RNA mutants like RD1, RD4, other uh, dicer, other genes, and they can't protect themselves. They can't form small RNAs against the virus. So uh, um, they are, uh, so, so the virus replicates in the worm. And with this system in hand, what I did was, I wanted to check if, if this immunity transmits transgenerationally via small RNA. So I took worms that have a functional RNA system and I infected them with a virus, expressed this virus of the transgene in these worms. And then these worms and they have a functional RNA system they made small RNAs against the virus, which led to the destruction of the virus. And they stayed black. They didn't shine in green. And this was shown by others. But then in the next generation, I, uh, using crosses, I isolated progeny that are RNA mutants. They don't have genes that are necessary for the novel establishment of RNA. And then I again challenged them with a virus. And I wanted to see, will they be green? Will the virus replicate or will they stay black? Since they don't have the capacity to produce their own small RNAs de novo against the virus, they should be green, just like in the previous slide. 
that is unless they inherited small RNAs from their parents that can protect them. They were already born containing these heritable small RNAs. And what I saw when I did this experiment is that 100% of the worms science the virus very efficiently. And not only that, also the grandkids have science the virus completely in a perfect way. So it's not maternal contribution of the protein because it lasts for multiple generations. And it can even last longer for many, many generations. And also we sequence small RNAs in this paper from worms that can't produce their own small RNA, that only their parents can generate them the novel. And importantly, we identified that small RNA inheritance and this heritable trait depends on an enzyme that's called RNA, which is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And these are polymerases that synthesize RNA, small RNAs, but they use mRNA as templates. So this allows the, the, the worms to re-amplify the heritable re response that form more and more small RNAs in every generation. Yeah, and as I said, we sequenced in this paper for the first time heritable small RNAs. What we found already in this paper was that this RNA-based inheritance doesn't follow the rules that Mendel discovered 150, over 150 years ago that describe how DNA-based inheritance works. Of course, Mendel's rules just reflect meiosis, what happens in meiosis and chromosome seg segregation. And small RNA inheritance doesn't follow Mendel's rules. There are other rules at play. And we studied these rules and I'll describe them in a, in a, later on in the talk. Later, uh, a few years after, Craig Mello's lab has shown that also with another more natural virus, there is transgenerational uh, protection or transgenerational immunity. Uh, so it's a, it's a more of a general principle, not just the, the one virus that we studied, which was artificial. Okay. We wanted to know whether there are other traits that are transmitted transgenerationally with smaller, by small RNAs. And the first trait that we studied is, and the first thing, the first environmental stress that we wanted to study was starvation or dietary changes, because the biggest epidemiological studies in humans and also uh, studies in, in rodents have shown the starvation leads to a heritable effect that affects the descendants. And the most famous uh, study is the, the study of the hungry winter or the Dutch famine, where um, people have shown that uh, uh, women that were starved while pregnant uh, by the Nazis in the Second World War, their kids and also grandkids suffer from all kinds of diseases like diabetes and also schizophrenia. And it can't be just explained by changes in the DNA. Uh, and Audrey Hepburn, the famous actor, was there as a, as a kid. This is also famous. But in these studies, in most of these studies on uh, the effect of starvation, first of all, there's no mechanism. And second, um, people didn't really show that you need an epigenetic mechanism to transmit the effect across generations because they focused, because they, they only studied one or two generations down the road. So this is called intergenerational inheritance in contrast to transgenerational inheritance. So what's the difference? So in intergenerational res uh, responses, it's not the number of generations that, that count. The question is whether the descendants were exposed to the original trigger to the stress or not. In the case of the Dutch famine, the women were starved while pregnant. So their babies was, were directly affected by the starvation. They were themselves affected. Not only that, since the babies had germ cells, you can say that two generations down the road, that even the great kids were directly affected by the starvation. Only the next generation, you can actually examine a, a, a generation that wasn't exposed at all by the stress, to the stress, and therefore effects that will be discovered in this generation will truly necessitate a new inheritance mechanism. And this wasn't done in, in most of the studies. So when we studied C. elegans, we went directly to the F3, to study un, uh, um, truly transgenerational effects. And when you start, uh, and in silicon, you can easily distinguish between nature and nurture, which is not trivial in other uh, complicated organisms. Like if your parents were starved, perhaps you will behave differently, but perhaps they'll teach you to eat more or something like this. In silicon, you can con control exactly what they eat. So when the, when the worms hatch, um, you can just uh, grow them on, on uh, plates without bacteria, without food. 
And if you stab the worms, they arrest at the L1 stage and they stay can stay like this, arrested for even 10 days without dying. We only stab them for six days to avoid selection, so none of them will die. And, but then after, after you bring them back to food, they, uh, they, they continue developing and go through the other stages and, and reach adulthood. When the worms is starved, even for a short time, it changes a large percentage of its genes, gene expression. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a major event that the worms know that they have the program to respond to uh, because they probably in real life move, move between uh, um, um, times of feast and times of famine. For example, they find an apple in theory, and then they take a, a few generations to consume the apple, and then they will be starved again for a long time. So they, they have this developmental program, uh, 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 um, dedicated program to deal with this type of event. So what we did is we grew worms that were well fed and we let the, them uh, lay eggs on, on plates with or without food. Uh, and then we start them for six days and we sequence their mRNAs in small RNAs. We saw that the, there are changes in, in small RNAs that target nutrition related genes. And we then continue to, to grow the next generations on food for multiple generations and sequence also from the F3, uh, their great grandchildren. And what we found is that the, the, the transcriptional changes uh, in the, in the great-grandchildren reflect the changes in the parents. So they are transmitted transgenerationally, and these effects depend, the inheritance depends on RNA inheritance machinery. So it depends on, on small RNA genes in the parents, uh, genes that uh, protein that, that are necessary for, um, for synthesizing the small RNAs. And it also depends on an, on a, an argonaut protein, a protein that carries physically small RNAs in the germline, only for the transgenerational transmission of the responses. And this protein is called HRD1. This stands for heritable RNA deficient one. And it's one of the many argonauts that C. elegans has. And this is an argonaut that's necessarily only for transgenerational inheritance. It was discovered by multiple labs in parallel by um, Scott Kennedy, Eric Mishka, Rene Ketting, and, and Craig Mello at the same time. Over the years, we and others have shown that there are many uh, environmental responses that lead to transgenerational changes. Not every response does it. For example, we found that growing worms in liquid affects the F1, but it's not affected. It's not transmitted transgenerationally. And there are other intergenerational uh, responses were described by others. These do not depend on small RNA uh, genes. However, transgenerational responses appear too, in, in most cases studied, uh, depend on small RNA inheritance, as this is true for viral exposure, starvation, gro growth in high temperatures, and also uh, exposure to pathogenic bacteria. And, but most of the time when you think about memories, because I'm talking about heritable memories, then you, most people think about memories that are encoded in the brain. And I think that the, one of the holy grails of this, of this field is to know whether the memories that are encoded in the brain by the nervous system can transmit transgenerationally. And the reason that I think that these type of memories are um, the most interesting ones is, first of all, I mean, the brain is capable of, of encoding more complicated uh, um, complex memories. But any tissue that would transmit a response to transgenerational, that's interesting. But the, the brain, unlike any other organism, is good at planning ahead and calculating uh, or summing and synchronizing responses from the inside and the outside, and then planning, deciding what's the best course of action. And just this idea that maybe the, the, the brain can plan the destiny of the next generation, I think that's very, very provocative and interesting. And also, kinds of not entirely goes around this teleological loop that inheritance of acquired uh, trait is present in. We recently wrote a review about it, questioning whether this is possible or not and in which organism it was selected for the cover. But we also, in a, aside from speculating on this, we also uh, published on this area. And we, we uh, a few years ago, but we, before I describe our, our uh, paper uh, about um, uh, transgenerational responses from the brain. I want to, to tell you a, a little bit about the history of, of this question because it was studied before. It was studied in the 70s and 80s and ended up in catastrophe, it ended up in nothing. So 
In the, in the 70s, there was this researcher, James McConnell, who studied another type of worm. This is a flat worm called, that's called planaria, which is really the, the champion of regeneration. It has a bigger brain than C. elegans. It's, it's a bigger worm and it, it has actual lobes in its brain. It's, it's a complicated brain. But you can chop off the head and the part of the tail will regrow a new brain. This was this is studied. This is a classic uh, developmental biology or regenerative uh, uh, biology. Many people study this. You can even chop up this uh, this uh, planaria to hundreds of pieces, and each piece will regenerate and form a new worm. But what McConnell said is that he can teach worms these planaria all kinds of memories, and then he can chop off their heads, and the new head that will grow from the part of the tail will still contain their memory. And uh, and people didn't believe him. Uh, some people replicated his work. Some some didn't. It was also it also inspired controversial work in other organisms such as rats and mice, which also ended up in nothing. But that was the least of his concerns because these studies ended when he received a, a bomb from the terrorist known as the Unabomber, who targeted many scientists uh, and other people. Uh, and he was, uh, and I think his assistant was hurt. He wasn't killed, but that's the end of his story. Nevertheless, uh, 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 30 years later, um, just uh, in 2013, the lab of, of Mike Levine from uh, Boston uh, showed that they can replicate some of these results using a very sophisticated system of automatic training and, and tracking of the, of the worms of planarians. So perhaps some of it is true. But, but, but it's not clear entirely whether it was exactly the same thing that McConnell showed. Because McConnell said additional things. What McConnell, McConnell also said that he can just take worms, these planaria, teach them something, grind them up, and feed them to other planaria to transmit the memories. Planaria are cannibalistic, they eat one another. And he said that the memory can transfer by feeding. And this is totally crazy, but as I just told you, worms can take up RNA from bacteria. C. elegans can. So perhaps, and also planaria can take up um, a double strand RNA from, from liver if they eat chopped liver. And this is something that planaria researchers use to induce RNA. But McConnell, uh, McConnell studies, although controversial, reached the popular uh, media. So there are comics books written about it. There's even a Star Trek episode where you see one character. Uh, this is uh, Data and Gordy explain to the other how memory works and it tells him, and you can read it yourself, that memory is encoded in RNA molecules. And why RNA? Because McConnell said, <laughs> not only, he took this fraction of the, of the, the worms that he chopped up to feed the other ones. He took uh, the, the chopped up planaria and he separated them to different fractions. So just the fraction of the DNA, just the RNA, or just the lipid, or just the protein. And he said that the fraction that transmit the memory is the fraction of the RNA. And this is very interesting because this is done in the 70s and 80s, long before we knew anything about regulatory RNA. Whether this was just a, a lucky guess or he was onto something, no one knows because this wasn't really replicated properly in the modern age. Okay, now what we did is we went back to C. elegans and we want, and Celia has had much more powerful tools. It's very hard to do genetics in planaria. And we took worms that don't, that uh, uh, mutants that don't have the gene RD4, which is a gene that's necessary for uh, synthesis of particular uh, type, particular species of small RNA. And we expressed RD4, we rescued RD4's expression specifically in the neurons of the worm using a panneuronal promoter. We used a few different panneuronal promoters and also expressed them at different um, um, copy numbers. And we made sure that the, no, that, that the RD4 rescue is very specific to neurons and it doesn't leak to the germline using literally six different techniques, including sequencing DNA just from the germline. And then what we did is we isolated the progeny of the worm that lost the rescued RD4. And we sequenced small RNAs from their parents and from the, from the progeny. And we found small RNAs that are RD4 dependent in the progeny, which means that they must have come from the nervous system of the previous generation. And they last for at least three generations. We also did the experiments where we sequenced um, wild type worms by isolating just neurons or just the germline. And we 
For this, we had to develop a, a system for isolating neurons for small RNA sequencing. This wasn't done before because it's very difficult to isolate the neurons because the cells explode when you lyse the cuticle of the worms. But uh, uh, other labs uh, designed the protocols for isolating cells for mRNA express, uh, sequencing. We use it for small RNA uh, sequencing for the first time. We weren't interested in just making a long list of small RNAs that are potentially inherited. We wanted to follow their inheritance across generations. So first of all, we found that this neurons to germline mediated inheritance depends on HRD1, this argonaut. And also we defined a list of, sm of uh, uh, small RNAs that actually regulate the gene, the, 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 the gene targets expression in the next generation. And we followed up on these genes using single molecule fish to see in which tissue they are regulated transgenerationally. And what we discovered is very interesting. We found this sort of a, a reverse Weizmann rule. We find that, that one, one, while the stoma can communicate with the germline, so somatic tissues can generate transgenerational responses, the silent stays in the germline in almost all cases, except for some very interesting exceptions. In most cases, the silent stays in the germline while stomatic genes re-express. So it's sort of a reverse Weizmann barrier. The germline is the one that can transmit the response back to the stoma of the next generation. And we trapped some of these genes which are transgenerationally regulated by the parent's nervous system to find out whether they have any function, whether, this is the most interesting thing, whether the nervous system can control the physiology of the next generation and specifically whether the nervous system can control the behavior of the next generation, because that's the ultimate function of the, of the nervous system to produce behavior. Probably also the reason that the nervous system even evolved. And what we found is we found that RD4 mutants, they, they appear pretty normal, these RNAi mutants. However, if you look carefully, you see that it, in relatively high temperatures, slightly stressful temperatures, 25 degrees instead of 20, they have a defect in chemotaxis behavior. They can't find food. However, this is true for RD4 mutants that were homozygous mutants for many, many generations. In contrast, RD4 mutants, that the homozygous mutants that derive from ancestors that were heterozygous for RD4, that they have one function, a copy of RD4, show improved behavior. They have a, a lesser defect in chemotaxis. And it's enough for the nervous system, for, for the, the next generation to, to express RD4, for the previous generation to express RD4 just in the brain, for the homozygous descendants, even three generations down the road, to behave better. So the nervous system, by producing RD4 dependent small RNAs, can control the capacity of the next generation to find food, this very crucial behavior. And by tracking down the genes that are transgenerationally regulated by the brain, we identified SAGE2, this one gene, which is responsible for some of the transgenerational regulation of this behavior. So if you, so in, in wild type worms, SAGE2 is downregulated all the time in the germline. However, in RD4 mutants, it is expressed. We found that if you CRISPR out a, a, a SAGE2, this target, the, in RD4 mutants, you restore their capacity to behave properly because you mimic the, the, the sensing of RD4, of, of SAGE2, which is normally made by the nervous system. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm close to the end of the talk. Just before I finish, I want to tell you something about the rules of this inheritance. It wasn't clear in the beginning whether this is whether small RNA inheritance or any epigenetic inheritance is just passive carryover of the parental response to the next generation, or alternatively, whether this is the regulated person and, and there are rules, rules for the segregation of the effect between the generations. So, uh, of course, the, the rules of genetics were identified by Mendel. Uh, they basically just show that how chromosomes segregate, uh, but uh, the, epi the rules of epigenetics are, are different. And in the beginning, before people knew about Mendel, they thought the traits just blend. This is called the blending inheritance. This is what everyone thought before they discovered Mendel. So if you have a, a, a yellow uh, father and a blue mother, it just combined, it's like the, the blending inheritance theory said that it's like just blending two uh, pots of paint, you get a green key. We know this is not the case because genes are particulate, they don't dilute and they don't blend. 
but people when they talk about transgenerational epigenetics, they still many times talk about this sort of a blending inheritance type of theory. So the parent experienced some trauma and then the kid will have it, but it will grow, uh, gradually go away until it's gone. This is what normal, most people thought. And also in, when it comes to RNA inheritance, people thought maybe the parents make some double strand RNA and then it gets diluted across generation until, until the response plan, uh, stops. Oh, we knew this can't be the case because everyone produces something like 250 babies. So the dilution factor is enormous. Most responses, when you just treat worms with RNAi to stand as a germline gene, most, in most cases, the response lasts three to five generations. At the population level, that's a fact that many people observe. So after four generations, the dilution factor would be 250 times 250 times 250, with, that will add up to four billions. And that's a dilution effect that's totally homeopathic and would never work, okay? In contrast, I told you that we found that RNA inheritance depends on RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that amplify the response. So the way that RNA works in C. elegans is that there are many types of primary small RNAs. They can derive directly from the double-strand RNA substrate, be exogenous siRNAs or endogenous siRNAs, showing interferon RNAs, or they can be pyRNAs or ribosomally derived small RNAs. All of these primary small RNAs do not lead to silencing. What they do is they recruit RNA-dependent RNA polymerases to the mRNA, which then synthesize lots of secondary or amplified small RNAs, which are much more abundant. And they, and they are 22 nucleotides longer they start with a G. And these are the ones that get inherited. So if you amplify small RNAs in every generation, you can ask the opposite of the question. Why does it ever stop? If you can sequence them, if you make, can make them over and over again. We think that it stops because it, it's not adaptive to just memorize everything that your parents did. You wanna keep the adaptive things, the things that work and forget most of it. And we identified in this paper, this is a Lea who is a heavy paper uh, from a few years ago, a, a negative feedback response that shuts down inheritance after a few generations. And this is a, a negative feedback loop that in, that's encoded by small RNA themselves, which regulate the small RNA inheritance machinery. And we identified the genes that participated this in this feedback loop or in this clock. We call this the time transgenerational timer. And we call these genes MOTEC genes, modified transgenerational epigenetic kinetic genes. And MOTEC to the Hebrew speakers in the audience is, is, is a sweetheart in Hebrew. Most people don't know this, but this is why we call it, this is why we force this weird acronym on the, on the, on the gene. But in, in MOTEC mutants, the response can have very different duration. So it can last hundreds of generations even because the clock doesn't work, doesn't shut down the inheritance as it should. Very recently, we published a paper in eLife in which we showed that stress resets RNA inheritance. So typically, if you start an RNA response in the parents, it will last for three to five generations. However, if you stress the F1s, the response will stop immediately. And this is true for a number of different stresses for high temperature starvation and high salt. We didn't check other stresses. It's possible that other stresses will do the same, but it also, it's not a passive thing. It depends on stress signaling. And the worm needs to know that it's being stressed to stop the inheritance. We, some of the genes that we identified, the motor genes are extremely potent. So for example, MET2, which is a chromatin, uh, it's a methyl transferase that affects H3K9 methylation. In MET2 mutants, the response doesn't stop. It lasts, it's, it lasts stably for tens or hundreds of generations. And this also uh, reminds me, and I won't go into it because it's a, it's a big topic where we studied a lot in the, in, the, in the lab, that small RNA inheritance work by the small RNA going to the nucleus and affecting the chromatin. And there's a very interesting interplay between chromatin modifications and small RNA biogenesis, which is crucial for small RNA inheritance. It's a complicated area that we won't get into. But worms, but, but the small RNAs also have a life outside of the nucleus. So they go out of the nucleus to these nuclear, uh, uh, to these uh, uh, germ granules, these liquid-like granules or condensates, where most of the machinery that's needed for transgenerational inheritance is present. So for example, the, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, the many of the argonam. And this is where they get made. They go back and forth to the nucleus and between the, these granules and the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now, already in 2011, in the first, in the, the virus paper, I found that when you start an RNA response in the parent, it segregates 
asymmetrically between the progeny, although the progeny is genetically identical. Some of the progeny will have a very strong response that lasts for a long time, while others will stop silencing after three or four generations. It wasn't clear what's the difference because the ones are isogenic. So where is the differences coming from? Only recently in a paper that we published last year, we found that there's an active mechanism that generates variability. And it's a sort of, we think of it as a sort of a bet hedging mechanism, just like the mechanism, like the combination that generate genetic variability. Here there's a mechanism that generates epigenetic variability. And we found that HSF1 expression in the parents dictates whether the progeny will inherit the response strongly or weakly. And that there are three basic principles that allow you to predict which, to predict how the response would segregate in the, pro, in the progeny across a lineage. And it allows you to predict not only responses to double strand RNA, but also responses to stress such as starvation. And I won't go into it because this is published. You can look into it. It's a little complicated to explain in detail. The last thing that I will tell you, this is really my, my second to last slide, is that we wanted to know whether the descendants of worms that inherited an epigenetic response following stress are genetically different from the descendants of worms that did not express, uh, experience stress. Otherwise, after the effect, the epigenetic effect is gone, they will be the same. And what we found in, a, and we published this in a recent preprint, is that when you stress the worms by putting them in high temperature for, temperatures for a few generations, small RNAs are inherited, and these small RNAs affect the physiology of the sperm. And when the sperm, the sperm doesn't function optimally and doesn't fuse with the oocyte as it should, then the worm starts secreting a pheromone which attracts males. The worms are hermaphrodites, they can make sperm and, 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 and uh, eggs. However, they are also males who just have sperm. And when the worms run out of sperm, they secrete a pheromone that attracts the males, and then the males mate with the hermaphrodites, donating their own sperm. And, and this is affecting so, and, and, and high temperature stress makes multiple generations down the road. We saw this also in lab evolution experiments to mate more with males. And when you mate more, more with males, you diversify your genome. Now you mix two different genomes. So you have much more, many more alleles. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, so you spread your genes less effectively. On the other hand, you increase variability and give evolution more raw material to choose from, which is beneficial in stressful conditions. So indirectly, epigenetic inheritance can actually also affect genetic inheritance. And this uh, transgenerational effect can be canceled completely by inducible degradation of HRD1, this agro, uh, argonaut, uh, with uh, an HRD1, uh, a degron tagged HRD1 that is degraded when you add oxygen, this plant hormone to the one. So we have a very nice system to see, to control this type of transgenerational inheritance. And I will just summarize that many times people, when they, they talk about the transgenerational effect, they contrast the theories of Lamarck and Darwin. But in fact, Darwin believed in the inheritance of acquired traits, even wrote about it in the origin of the species. And he suggested that every cell in the body secretes gamuls or these vesicles that contain that, that vote on the constitution of the of the offspring. And this is called pangenesis, considered to be completely wrong. But recently there was a paper that said that maybe these gamuls that Darwin hypothesized are the smaller names. Maybe that's a reviving the pangenesis theory of Darwin. And I think that it's possible that RNA inheritance and, and epigenetic inheritance, perhaps also other types of epigenetic inheritance, were always in the background and we missed them because we only looked at the DNA-based sequences. And as you know, when the human genome was sequenced in 2001, People were surprised to find that worms and humans have pretty much the same number of genes, and corn has double the, the number of genes. It's how you use your genes and not the number of genes that counts. And perhaps uh, um, epigenetic inheritance is one mechanism that contributes to, that, to our complexity, although we don't know whether the same mechanism that we discovered in worms are happening also in humans. We just don't. And that's a very important disclaimer. So, with this important uh, uh, last uh, note, I will. Uh, thank you for listening and thank the lab who actually did the work. Uh, and of course, I'll be very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this fantastic seminar. Uh, I think we can open up for questions. Uh, Dr. Felix Resillas, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, thank you. First of all, th thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute and, and uh, I don't know if you know, but we are part of the epigenetic groups in the Institute. Uh, I used to be a, a former postdoc of Gary Felsenfeld. And then we really enjoyed your talk and it's fantastic. As, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's fantastic. As, as Myra knows, we, we have been in contact with Edith Hurd and we have been talking about transgenerational inheritance in many occasions. But um, if I understood well, my question is, you are not uh, in favor of direct and tracking transgeneration inheritance because the frequency in order of the magnitude of this heritage is very low. But at the same time, you are proposing an RNA, inter, an RNA mechanism of transmission of this, this inheritance that we are convinced exists. But the problem is the frequency of this transmission is correct. Uh, what are your thoughts about that, that point? And, 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 and one more time, thank you for your talk. It was fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. No, so in fact, you know, the slide where I talked about epigenetic inheritance, epigenetic reprogramming is taking from this Edith Herd and Martinson review. Exactly. Uh, where they discuss uh, epigenetic reprogramming as a barrier to transgenerational inheritance. Mm -hmm. However, however, it is true that 10% of the marks are not removed. And this is true even in humans, probably. There are studies from uh, different groups uh, that, that show this. So I don't exclude it. Could definitely be still a mechanism for transmission of some traits and not others. That's a possibility. Okay. With regard to, with regard to uh, RNA reprogramming, less is, um, almost nothing is known. We know that C in C. elegant is a very robust uh, thing that allows you to just you know expose one to double strand RNA and look at the next generation. However, also in worms, there are things that we don't understand. So if you silence it, so most of the studies were done with a very limited number of genes as targets. Okay. For simplicity and for you know, the ease of manipulation, most people silence branch genes like GFP or Cherry and so on. Mm -hmm. And there are a few endogenous uh, genes that can also be silenced transgenerationally by RNA. But many genes, when you target them with RNA, are not transgenerationally regulated. In exactly. fact, this is, the, this is the majority. And we described it also. We don't understand the difference between the genes that do and the genes that don't. Exactly. And so so, so uh, uh, perhaps we're just lucky to land on a few that, that gives you a good response. But, then, but then, there are things that we just don't know. Then, then you will be agree that this is, for example, if we're thinking about the Mendelian transmission of, of genetic inheritance, you have a percentage. You, have, you, you can predict theoretically the percentage of transmission. This is why in transgenerational is very hard to, to predict. Right, right. But but we, we did do things like that in the few cases where we can actually look at very robust uh, robust uh, transgenerational sciencing, like with the GFP sciences or okay. MCHERI. This we did, and then you do see certain rules that describe the propagation across generations that allows you to predict the response. But okay. just like most most diseases and traits are not Mendelian, they are complex, and then it's much, it's a bigger challenge. Here, I don't think we even have the design of mm -hmm. how to do such an experiment when it comes to the, the, the segregation of a complex trait like the response to starvation. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayra. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Marti. Go ahead, Marti. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Odette, for a great talk. Um, I have a question. Uh, the results shown uh, showed uh, from you and from other groups uh, paint a scenario where you have a two-way system where the information, presumably RNAs, flow from uh, the neurons to the germline, or, or well, from the environment to the uh, neurons in the case of odorants, uh, and from neurons to the germline, and then 
uh, from the germline to the neurons or the other uh, cells that may control the uh, behavior. Do you know, well, uh, from the ones that follow you on Twitter, this may be a funny question, but do you know what's the mechanism in, in which the information flows from neurons to the germline, uh, the no. RNAs? Right, this is a great question. And the, the answer is that we don't know. And this is something that one of the main focuses of the lab. And we said it very explicitly in our paper that we don't even know that the small RNAs transfer from the neurons to the germ. This is perhaps the most parsimonious explanation, but we can't rule out because we can't take these small RNAs at the moment, these endogenous small RNAs. We can't rule out the possibility that there's some indirect effect that the small RNAs affect some hormone that then communicates with the germline, changes the small RNA pools there that get inherited. What we do now is we use stage two as a reporter. This is a gene that's being regulated by the nervous system in the germline. We use it as a reporter for unbiased mutagenesis screens to try to identify components that prevent these neurons to germline communication to try to, to study the mechanism and how it works. Uh, but, uh, but this is an ongoing uh, uh, study and we don't know. We don't know anything about small RNA movement between cells when it comes to endogenous small RNAs only with regard to exogenous small RNAs, artificial ones. And it is a very, very important question. Thank you, Oret, and Thank thanks you. again for a great talk. Thank you. Great, now we have a couple of hands raised. So Sylvia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your really great talk. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, I, I just wondering, so when, when you see the transmission is maybe even potentiating from generation to generation, and then there, there needs to be an active mechanism to stop it. What happens if the F3 or some generation exposed to the same stimuli that uh, initiate the first, uh, yeah, that trigger all that inheritance. Uh, it's a great this. question. No. It's a great question. So uh, as I told you, uh, uh, we found that if you stress the F1s, then it stopped the inheritance. However, this was, we saw just a, a few months ago, but in our 2016 cell paper, this, this is who is the heavy paper for 2016, we showed that if you start an RNA response, let's say you, you, you silent GFP, and then in the F1s, you were both the ones to another trigger to uh, uh, even an RNA, it's an, it's an exogenous RNA response, but you can silence not only GFP, you can even silence um, M cherry or another gene then you extend the duration of the original ancestral response. So if the, tape, the same time of stress, the same time of response, environmental response to RNA, then it extends the inheritance. And you can continue, we call it a second trigger effect, and you can continue to do it in the F3 and F4. But if you didn't do it in the F1, then it won't work. And this is also true for the stress that erases. It. There's something plastic about the F1s, which is very interesting. We don't know exactly what it is. We have some theory. Okay. Another thing that we've shown is that this is also true for the response to high temperatures. If, and this is was also shown by Ben Lerner. If you stress the ones with high temperatures, there's a transgenerational response, which is short-lived. But if you, if you put a few generations uh, in high temperatures, you get a stronger response that lasts for many generations. Okay, thank you. And, and how this works exactly, we don't know. We have some theories, not clear entirely. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Rosa, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maida. Uh, thank you very much for that for your you. beautiful talk. It was it's it was a blast for us. Uh, I'm I work uh, with C. elegans as well. I've been working with. Uh, I made my postdoc twenty years ago at Harvard Medical School with Kit Blackwell. Mm -hmm. And we work uh, with stress granules and apoptosis in here in Mexico, in my laboratory. So I was um, very into liquid-liquid phase separation. So um, there's something that is very intriguing about these um, granules that you were talking about, is that they are in some point during development, they are fused with germ granules, and then they um, divide into two different granules. 
So what is, what do you think it's the, uh, the meaning of this dissolution of the pranials? And if the, if, do you think only the replication period is necessary in this stress granule or the, I mean, the RNA granule? Or what do you think is the role? Yeah, this is very, it, it's again, this is the frontier. It's very, very interesting. And as you know, a few years ago, Scott Kennedy has shown, people knew that the germ granules were required for RNA in the germ name. And, and a few years ago, uh, um, Scott Kennedy has shown that the P granules, um, that, that another granule, the Z granule, bud off the P granule at a certain point of development, and then you have three granules, one after the other, P, Z, and M, and probably the RNA, the mRNA that goes out of the nucleus goes through these granules consecutively to be selected for silencing. This was, uh, many other people uh, worked on it. Very recent, and, and we've shown that if you disrupt the germ granules, then you get transgenerational effects that are very long lasting because the wrong small RNA are made now against the wrong gene because you mess up the selection process. And this gives you also a parent of origin effect and it, it's very fascinating. Very recently, there was a, a, a preprint from Craig Mello where he showed, I think it's a beautiful uh, paper, that what happens is that as the mRNA goes out of the nucleus, if it is selected for silencing, it gets trapped in one of these granules. And then only this granule is enlarged because it makes lots of small RNA. And, and, and then the DNA of the target gets recruited to the nuclear pore that's closest to these, to these particular granules where small RNAs are made, the two alleles are brought back uh, uh, one next to the other. And then the small RNAs in the nucleus somehow lead to the, to the silencing by uh, chromatin changes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's still very descriptive, but it's mm -hmm. clear that the, the, these granules are the key to understanding how this inheritance works. Okay, thank you. And another question. Do you think there, did, did you mention something about uh, that some of the information that is transmitted is in the gut or it could uh, be in the gut? It, it could definitely be. I mean, we know that the double strand RNA responses that are transmitted from feeding of bacteria lead to transgenerational changes. And this is first initiated in the gut. There's also newer studies from Colin Murphy about potential responses to pathogenic bacteria that are mediated by the gut. So what she suggests in a, a, a series of papers that the worms digest bacterial RNA, pathogenic bacterial RNA, which is taken up and lead to the avoidance of the same bacteria transgenerational. So, um, so it's certainly possible and the, gut, um, and the gut is involved. And have you seen if any particular segment of the gut is involved or? Any... No, we, we didn't study this at all. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think that Colin Murphy described it in her paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm going to read a question in the chat from Diana Escalante. If you transfect RRF1 to mammalian cells, do they become resistant to viruses? Uh, and That's a great question. And what is H2, she adds? Yeah. Right. So the question about RF1 is a great question. Actually, there's one group who did it in Drusophila from Australia, I think. And they said that RNA works stronger. Um, I always wanted to do it to see whether you can transmit the uh, viral resistance to, to mammalian cells by potentiating their RNA system using C. elegans components. It's very complicated. There are many moving parts there. So we didn't do it. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a fascinating question. Stage one is not, it's not so much is known about it. It was identified as a, in a screen for genes that, uh, um, that affect foraging behavior that are required for foraging. And it affects a gene that's called Eagle 4, which is a transcription factor that locates to the nucleus after you learn something. I think it, it affects DNA acetylation also. It's part of a complex that deacetylates de uh, histones. Uh, but uh, uh, but but it's, it's, it hasn't been studied much. It's expressed all over the body. We saw that it's regulated transgenerationally, specifically in the germline. But it's also expressed in neurons. Thank you very much, Adet. It, it was mind-blowing, your 
your, okay. your thanks a lot thank you great um so i will ask something it's see if anyone else wants to ask um so as you mentioned you if you if we think about it you don't necessarily want all the experiences and uh, whatever happens in the somatic cells during a lifespan to be inherited to the to the germal do you have an idea of if if there which would be a selection mechanisms that defines what's going to be inherited uh, and what is not yeah, it's a it's a very good question people speculate and do models but it's a lot of it's really unclear so for example one thing that i think but maybe it's not true is that uh, the the you want to regulate responses that would be relevant to the next generation. So for example, if you are a worm and your generation time is just three days until the next generation is born. So many things that happen to you in your changes in your environment would be relevant to your kids. But, but if you are a human, it takes 20 years, maybe less so until you have kids. But, but there are some traits that would be relevant for your kids if you are a human as well. For example, encounters with viruses, because they reinfect us over and over again. So I think that the duration of the, of the stress could be something that would, uh, uh, or, or the frequency that you encounter it, the probability that you will uh, uh, encounter it again. I also think that there are many transgenerational responses that could be bad, to so just carry over or breakdowns of the system that will be detrimental. On the other hand, if we again go back and forth, some detrimental effect will also have a gain because of trade-offs. For example, in the starvation case, we found that in the next generation, the worms that descend from parents that were starved live longer. But I totally think that this could be a result of their germline being compromised and they, them being less fertile which leads to perhaps the extension of the, of the lifespan, but it's not necessarily adaptive. Um, so um, it, it, only in the last paper that we, in this last preprint that I discussed in the last slide, we actually did lab evolution experiments to show whether this actually is adaptive or not. Because without the entire context, you can't tell, unless you actually follow and you see that it spreads its genes more effectively across the population. But I think it's very hard to guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a question that, that, that's on YouTube uh, from Paul Delgado. Great talk. Um, downstream of F2, he fed a diet other than the parental diet and then reverted to the parental diet. Do they ad adapt again as long as the initial stress is induced before 100 generations? No, okay. so in the in the starvation case, we didn't follow that many generations. This is something that we did in other cases. In the starvation, we only examined three generations, uh, and we didn't check this. It's a very interesting question, but we didn't do the experiment. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, hi, thank you for the talk. And um, my question is. It's possible that the distal type cell of the gonad uh, has a master role in regulate the inheritance. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the first uh, the, the beginning of your question. Yeah, uh, and my question my question is that it's possible that the distal type cell uh, in the gonad uh, has a master role in regulate the inheritance. Yeah, it is possible that any tissue that would be very close to the, the gonad would have some very special intimate connection with it. For example, before we had a, we had a question about, about the gut. The gut is also connected with all kinds of connections to the germline int uh, intimately and would perhaps be therefore more privileged or more capable of transmitting transgenerational responses. So uh, 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 it's that true also about the distal tip cells or, or other cells in the proximity, uh, but we don't know this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Rosa, I don't know if you want to have another question. I can see your, ah, okay. And, uh, no, it was the last, I did it. <laughs> okay, <It's> okay. Right. <laughs> uh, then I can add another one. So the, the RNA dependent polymerases, this um, um, 
again a bit about the selection question. So how do they choose which mRNAs to amplify? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's a really great question. We don't know so much. So we know, for example, when you look at the, about heritable small RNAs, some things, there are some patterns. For example, genes with imperfect splicing often get targeted for, for transgenic sensing. I think that uh, this is, it doesn't apply to all the genes, but genes that look foreign or weird perhaps are, get transgenerationally silent. Uh, for example, uh, uh, genes that have, uh, this was found by Andrew Fire, um, to be expressed in the germline and to avoid this transgenerational sensing by small RNAs, genes need to have lots of ATs in their introns. So I think there are all kinds of determinants of the gene that show that this is a gene, a self gene that can be trusted and shouldn't be silent transgenerational because it's one of ours. But, but uh, that could be only a part of the answer. We don't fully know. Okay, great. Um, I have a, a, a kind yeah, of- Yeah, go, uh, go ahead, Ben. A kind of crazy question. I don't know, is it possible to transplant the cells from one worm to another, just like a one cell that, uh, that already has the, uh, this in, um, uh, RNAs inherited? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's possible in C. elegans. Maybe, but we are trying to do it in other worms. They have bigger cells. And uh, this is just in the beginning, but I hope to be able to tell you next time, maybe when I'm actually in Mexico. But uh, we do have some successes, which is with this crazy idea that you suggested. <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's, that's it. There are no more questions. Uh, so I want to just thank you again for this fantastic seminar and your time uh, that you share it with us. And we, of course, will be in touch to have you in, in real life <laughs> when, we, when we can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, Totally my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Adel. Bye Thank bye. You. Hasta luego, todo el mundo. Gracias. Gracias, Mayra. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Hasta luego.